Here it goes. Okay. Okay, I'm going to call the meeting to order. Uh, welcome everyone to the 1226th meeting of the Entomological Society of Washington today, February 3rd, 2022. Um, it's great to see everyone, uh, almost everyone. Uh, thank you for joining uh, us. I know that some parts of uh, the nation is experiencing some pretty intense uh, snowstorms, uh, so stay safe. Um, also, like Al said, uh, the meeting is being recorded uh, and, and then it'll be posted on our YouTube channel. Um, so you can turn your video off and, on, and, um, and also your name won't appear and you can remain anonymous if, if you want. So uh, we can share the link uh, for the Ed South Wash DC YouTube channel on the, in the chat and you can watch this and any other um, previous um, seminars we've had. Um, okay, so let's see. So um, we'll have uh, Gary Hevel read uh, the minutes. So. Sorry. Of the, of the last meeting. <laughs> the Lord, Lord, tomorrow, uh, call to order the 1225th regular meeting of the Entomological Society on the 2nd of January, 2022. Meetings continue to be virtual due to the COVID pandemic. This situation starting in October, 2020. Some 40 members and guests were noted, noticed to be in attendance. President tomorrow, Welcome the new president-elect, Matthew Buffington, then noted the other society officers for 2022. Continuing in their positions are Abigail Kula as treasurer, Alan Norbaum as program chair, Gary Hevel as recording secretary, Elizabeth Young as membership and communications secretary, Mark Metz as editor, and Nick Silverson as curator. Jamie Zonazer is now past president. Recording Secretary Gary Neville then read the minutes of the December meeting, and these were officially approved. Membership and Communications Secretary Elizabeth Young announced one new application for membership in the society, that being Emil McCarthy Earl, then read the following names as new members of the society. Alexander Gonzalez Haldren, P.R. Shashank, Alan H. Smith Pardo, Yuria Oka Yasu, Nayin Hawk, and Subic Sen. President elect Matt Ruffington noted that he had gained a speaker for the annual banquet, Jay Host Hostler, who is a prolific author of paperback educational books written for young readers. He is an effective outreacher and has moved, worked on bees and other insects. President Chamorro reported that during a visit to Mexico, in October, she purchased an unusual food item that included parts of ants. She has not yet tried this condiment. <laughs> Alan Norbaum introduced past president Jimmy Zanazer as the speaker of the evening, whose topic was newly discovered in the leaf hopper tribe Saltalini. Why there are 22,000 species known in the family. An estimate of the true size of the family registers at 100,000 100, species. The tribe Saltalini are found in grasslands and have disruptive color patterns. Over a number of years, Dr. Zonizer has conducted Field work for this group and collected specimens in many countries of South America. Three collecting methods were valuable in gaining specimens bug vacuums, sweeping, and malaise traps. After taxonomic research, he has produced a definitive work on Saltalini, which was published in Zootaxa last year. The research revealed two new genera and 36 new species. Unstable. Tribe is the high level of wing brachypterae. Dr. Zonazer offered, offered a series of images that depicted the species of his recent research and discussed their ranges in the neotropical region. There were many questions at the end of the program. 
The meeting was adjourned at 8 40 p.m. Great, thank you, Gary. Um, do we have a motion to approve the minutes as read? So moved. A second, I see a second, thank you. And uh, minutes are approved. Okay, we move on to uh, the, thank you very much, Gary, for that. Um, the reports of officers and committees. And I know that we have a report from our president elect, Matt Buffington. Hi, good evening, everyone. So we have some pro uh, updates on the, the angle, annual banquet. After some uh, rigmarole and investigative uh, work going through the emails and such, it appears that uh, if we stay with Woodend Nature Reserve, which is my preferred venue, um, we're not gonna be able to hold it in the evening anymore. So we will, um, if we do in the evening, we must pay for their catering services. And when we did the numbers, it's just far exceeding um, not only our budget, but uh, the, the spirit of the banquet with the potluck, I think is just such a highlight. And so we really need to find a venue where that's possible. So uh, the alternative is we actually get a very good deal uh, from uh, Woodend if we hold it during the day. So this would be sometime between nine and five. Um, nothing really says banquet like lunch hour. So uh, I think that's what we're gonna try. And uh, we're, we're scheduled for June 9. Uh, it's a Thursday. That's the soonest I could get. After that, the school programs take over wood in, so we can't do it. So we have this tiny window to nail there. Um, but because it's during the day, I think it all offers some opportunities perhaps we have uh, not been privy to. Um, we could have, I mean, some of the things we've thrown around is some a poster session, for instance, for students that want to get some exposure. Uh, we'll have the typical lecture the book signing, of course, uh, food. But um, because it's during the day and insect activity is a little bit different um, versus more crepuscular activity that we've experienced in the past, um, you know, I plan on being out there with my sweep net, maybe having a malaise trap set up, uh, do some demos, uh, do some, some hands-on stuff. Um, they're cool with it. I'm cool with it. Uh, I think it's worth a shot. So um, I'm still waiting to hear back from the speaker to confirm the date, um, but I have confirmed with Woodend and we've uh, kind of penciled in that date. Um, so it will be a little different. Uh, it'll be, you know, like I said, during the day and we'll figure out the time. So that's what I've got. Thanks. Great, thank you, Matt. Do you have any uh, reports from any of the officers who may be present. Okay, we'll move on to introduction of new members and visitors. So pass it on to you, Elizabeth, and take it away. Thank you, Lourdes. Uh, we have one new application for membership uh, in February. Uh, that is Joyce Gross from UC Berkeley. And uh, a new member announced in January is Eamon McCarthy Earls. Uh, and if there are any visitors in attendance, uh, this is your time to introduce yourself. We'd love to hear from you. You can unmute or you can put it in the chat if, if you'd like. Uh, hi, I'm Tina Litwack. I'm the science, the science illustrator for um, Lourdes and Matt and the rest of the Systematic Entomology Lab, Al, Stu, and whoever else is on here that I haven't noticed their names. So I take care of six, about 15 USDA scientists and do illustration and photography for them. Great, welcome. <laughs> this is my first meeting. This is Mike Merchant, um, retired from Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service uh, about a year ago and um, just sitting in on my first time. Great. Welcome. In Thank Washington, you so much for attending. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one thing we were saying that this format has allowed us to to just get to see more of the membership and uh, to to really um, connect in this way. So it's a good thing about the pandemic, I guess. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, 
I do have one more, one last announcement uh, that it's not too late to renew your membership for 2022. Um, I'm about to drop a link for our renewal form in the chat. Um, uh, just as a reminder, annual dues are $30 for a membership fee, for electronic access for the proceedings, $60 for electronic access, as well as uh, print copies of our proceedings published quarterly. Uh, and those uh, annual dues are available at half, half price for student memberships, and there are lifetime memberships available as well. Uh, and I'll be sending a, my, a reminder email later this week. So uh, just, uh, just a reminder to everybody. Thanks. Great. Just giving people who are visiting time to chime in, but if not, then that's okay. You can put it in the chat and say hello if you're shy. Uh, we'll do. move on. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah. Uh, we'll move on to unfinished business, and I don't think we have any unfinished business. Um, so we'll move on to new business, and this might qualify as old business, perhaps, but it's new to me. So I'll just share with the membership that we're redesigning our website. Um, so this is exciting too, and, and this will be a way to renew your membership and we're trying to put some new features and things like that and advertise our talks and so on. Um, so um, uh, be on the lookout for that. We'll be asking people to, to uh, maybe send us pictures of insights that could make it onto the website. We'll need, we'll need some uh, in order to um, you know, make make the website uh, insect friendly. And so, yeah, so just send me or um, I guess now for now, just me. <laughs> so that's the only um, new business and um, or announcement, I suppose. Uh, so now we'll move on to presentation of notes and exhibition of specimens. And this is a time when, when we present things that maybe um, you, you've come upon or some interesting new invasive species perhaps that you can't identify or something cool. So just keep that in mind for next meetings as well. If you come upon a really exciting book that you'd like to share. Um, I think Warren's got something there. I have a book. Okay. <clears throat> I don't what know if that? any of you were <laughs> students of Don Messersmith but I was, and so was Bill Murphy and George, yes. Uh, anyway, Don has produced this privately published book. It has no ISBN or nothing, but it's lots of pages. He did uh, a big road trip around the US and Southern Canada after his wife Sherry passed in 2013. And he has written his basic biography and all kinds of good stuff. And uh, it's not much entomology, but he did wish us, <clears throat> where is it? <clears throat> Good collecting. <laughs> so you can't argue with that. But anyway, I took uh, two or three entomology courses from him at Maryland. Yeah, Bill's, <laughs> Bill's got his copy. <laughs> yeah, but Bill is pictured in there. and. Uh, Anyway, uh, Don was one of the, uh, the Earth Watch leaders that got me to Belize in 1981. And we blitzed all kinds of insects now in the Smithsonian collection. And um, it led to other Earth Watch trips with Margaret Collins, who you may have known, a termite lady. And uh, anyway, um, just a note on uh, Epi entomology. Great, great, thank you. And uh, um, I've had a few uh, posts on the chat about uh, expanding on the uh, pictures for the website, and also thank you, Matt Bertone, for offering uh, to to use your your really amazing photographs. Um, that definitely will will make use of that. So we're we're working with a company to design the website, and they have asked for the kind of banner of the website uh, they've asked mm -hmm. for pictures so, so that they can be kind of in a rotating basis and perhaps other pages of the website, they can be um, used for that. So um, 
we have a kind of a mock-up um, that we can share at the next meeting. And then you can get a sense of, of what, what it will look like. But, uh, but yeah, just in sec pictures. So I'm putting my email, eswpresident at gmail.com in the chat and you can use that and um, to, to connect with me. Um, I, you have, remember you have access to all of the um, illustration archives, I mean, through me, because they're not really available yet through the Smithsonian, but all the USDA stuff over the past, you know, 12 years is available and a lot of it has been published in ESW, so that's, oh, great. It, you know, it, 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 illustrations look different on a website than, than photos and sort of it, sometimes it's nice to have both. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know where to find me. <laughs> Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, so now um, if, if there are no more announcements, then we'll move on to the presentation of our announced topic and I'll hand it over to our program chair, Alan Norbaum. And thank you for sitting patiently while we go through our business part of the meeting. Uh, okay, thanks, Lourdes. Um, <clears throat> Uh, before I introduce our, our speaker, um, I'll just mention that um, next uh, month's speaker at the March 3rd meeting will be Art Evans of the Virginia Museum of Natural History. Um, I see he's in attendance tonight. Maybe later on he can tell us what he's going to talk to us about. I think it's one of his, uh, a new book. Um, anyway, we have um, at least 43 members in attendance. There's that many Zoom connections. And, some of them have multiple people at them. Um, but now I'd like to um, introduce Dr. Will Kuhn. He has served as the Director of Science and Research at Discover Life in America since 2018. Although native to the coastal plains of East Texas, he has lived in or near the Appalachian Mountains for the past 12 years, earning his master's degree in entomology at Virginia Tech and his PhD in evolutionary biology at uh, Rutgers in New Jersey. Um, he studied flight behavior in dragonflies for his graduate work, but since then he's become more of an entomological generalist and aspiring naturalist. He enjoys learning a bit more each day about the rich fauna and flora of East Tennessee and especially the Smokies. Recently, he's been obsessed with documenting every critter he can find in his small suburban neighborhood in Knoxville and slowly but surely creating a native meadow to support biodiversity in his own backyard. Sounds like a, a Gary Hevel kind of project. <laughs> um, anyway, um, his talk tonight is entitled uh, Smokies ATBI, a 23-year 20 year biodiversity inventory in Great Smoky Mountains National Park. So welcome, Will, and we'll hand it over to you. All right. Thanks so much for inviting me, and uh, it's been wonderful uh, sitting through your meeting and and uh, seeing a lot of faces um, or seeing a lot of faces with with names that I know and um, and also I've I'm, I've got up on my other screen uh, flipping through Matt Bertoni's amazing uh, images on Flickr. These are just gorgeous. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited to talk to you today about the All Taxa Biodiversity Inventory in Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And before I get started, I just want to thank um, everyone in the, um, everyone who has worked on this project uh, in the past or present. Um, and I see uh, several, several names that I recognize that uh, of, of people that I think have worked on the ATBI uh, here in the audience or have contributed to it in some way. So thank you. So Discover Life in America, um, the nonprofit that I work for is one of four uh, nonprofits that support the National Park. Uh, there's also the Institute at Tremont that uh, provides in-house education, Great Smoky Mountains Association that produces uh, field guides and runs the bookstores and does a lot more like interpretation, uh, and Friends of the Smokies that is the um, philanthropic uh, nonprofit supporting the park. And so all of these, we, uh, we, we all work to, to make the park a better place. And we're kind of the, the sort of research arm of these nonprofits. 
And we work in the Smokies. Uh, Great Smoky Mountains National Park is situated on the Tennessee, North Carolina border. Um, and it is 800 square miles, 500,000 something uh, acres. It's a really big place and uh, just really gorgeous, um, especially in the fall. Um, it's just such a neat place to work and uh, just a really incredible place for biodiversity uh, for a number of reasons. It's got um, uh, quite a range of, uh, of elevation and topography, um, this really neat kind of mountainous terrain. Um, it's a temperate rainforest. Um, Matt Buffington was was talking about visiting and, and it feeling, you know, like a like a rainforest uh, that you can also get barbecue next to. Um, so we have both. But uh, but yeah, it's uh, the only temperate rainforest that I know of in uh, in Eastern North America. And it's um, just really spectacular with with parts of um, some of the higher elevations receiving, I believe, as much as like eight feet of precipitation, which is just pretty incredible and provides for a lot of productivity. Uh, the geology here is also really fascinating with, um, with rocks here as old as a billion years um, and just a spectacular diversity of geology that also fuels biodiversity. And there's quite a few different kinds of vegetation communities. Depending on how you count, there's between 12 and 79 different vegetation communities. And each one of these has their own, um, their own biodiversity um, or fuels kind of their own type of biodiversity. And for, so for all these reasons and more, this is just an extremely biodiverse place um, and, a, and a spectacular place to, uh, to live and work. Um, but there are some threats to this biodiversity. One of them is that there are a number of gateway communities around the park um, that's where development is, um, is rampant. There's lots of short-term rentals and things like that. And, and just these areas continue to develop and, and encroach on the park in some parts. There's also... Um, a problem with air pollution. This is a little bit less of a problem than it used to be a couple of decades ago, but it's still a problem. We, we do get air uh, effects from air pollution as far away as Atlanta, which is about a three hour drive from the park um, and several other cities nearby as well, as well as just people driving around in, in and around the park. Um, and we also have problem with invasive species, things like hemlock woolly adelgid that's killed a lot of the, the hemlocks here in the park. There's also balsam woolly adelgid that was uh, more of a problem uh, a few decades ago. Um, kudzu is another big problem. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and a number of invasive, uh, other invasive plants, insects, um, mammals. And of course, climate change, which particularly affects the higher elevations of the park, but, um, but is, is starting to affect everywhere. Um, this is a photo from the 2016 uh, fire that raged through a big section of the park and into the gateway community called Gatlinburg. Um, and it was fueled in part by a summer long drought. Uh, so the the, uh, the whole area was extremely dry, and then there was a crazy wind event, um, just kind of one of these climate change extreme weather events that, that fueled this great fire. And so that's definitely a problem. And so our kind of um, mantra behind uh, what we do is that we can't protect a species if we don't know that it exists. So we actually, we have to know what's here in order to be able to understand it and protect it. And so for all these reasons and more, uh, back in 1998, park officials, uh, USGS officials, and several other agencies um, and local uh, entities around here um, decided that they wanted to do an inventory in the Smokies of the, of the species that lived here. And they called it the All Tax of Biodiversity Inventory. Um, this idea was Dan, uh, originally came from Dan Jansen, um, who, who kind of pioneered this in the tropics, 
Um, but to our knowledge, this was uh, kind of the, the first largest ATBI to be done uh, in North America. And uh, I believe it's the longest continuing ATBI or one of the longest continuing ATBIs. So with the ATBI, we seek to answer kind of four key questions. We want to know not just what species live in the Smokies, although that's a really difficult, surprisingly difficult question to answer. Uh, but we also want to know where these species live, when they occur, uh, things like that. We also want to know how rare or common they are. We want to know about endemic uh, endemism among these species. And um, last but not least, we want to know how these species actually interact with each other. What is the, the sort of web of connections that they form? If, if the park were to lose um, one of these species, you know, how would it affect uh, the other species that it's connected to? So um, it's kind of a, a holistic uh, picture at, uh, of an inventory in the park. And there are several current facets of the Smokies ATBI. So um, we at Discover Life in America, we conduct our own biodiversity work. Uh, we have an internship program um, that I'll talk a little bit more about in a second, where interns come and help us um, conduct this work. But um, we do uh, biodiversity surveys. We just did a big survey this last summer in Cades Cove, which is this big open meadow in the park. Um, and, uh, and over the years, we've had um, ATBI sample sites all over the park. Um, in the beginning of the ATBI, there was this kind of uh, big concerted effort to sample, do malaise trapping and other kind of trapping at, uh, at these disparate sites all across this huge park for like two years straight. So we're still going <laughs> through all the uh, insect and arthropod material uh, that was that was collected there, but we're also doing our own work or doing uh, new newer work. Um, we also work with researchers. Um, this is Mike Caterino on the top right, uh, who is looking at leaf litter arthropods in the high elevation uh, Appalachian Mountains, including the park. Um, we work with the National Park Service, uh, work very closely with, uh, with park staff um, and, uh, and help them with inventory and monitoring projects. Um, and we also leverage community scientists. And I'll talk more, a little bit more about this in a minute. Um, so just to give you an idea of uh, where we stand as far as the ATBI goes. So when we started this project back in 1998, there were somewhere around 9,600 species known to the park. Um, and now there's 21,302. So we've more than doubled the number of species known to the park. Um, a little over 10,000 of those are new records uh, for the park, um, meaning they were known outside the park, but not within. Uh, and over a thousand of those are new species of science. So they were described um, from material collected here in the Smokies, which is pretty cool. Um, just to give you an idea of what that looks like over time. So back in 1998 is when the project started. Uh, around the year 2000 is when um, uh, sampling across the park really started in earnest. Um, and you can see we've just gone up and up and up from there. Um, with more and more uh, new species of science being discovered um, pretty regularly. In 2018, we reached uh, our, uh, we reached 20,000 species in the park and um, we're continuing and there's not really much of a, a sign of, of slowing down at this point. In fact, we believe that there are we estimate there's somewhere between 60 and 80,000 species uh, total within the park. So we're somewhere between a third, a quarter and a third of the way there by that estimation. But um, that is again, just an estimation. So uh, to give you an idea of what this biodiversity, how this biodiversity breaks down, um, probably not surprising for you guys, the uh, insects make up almost half the park's biodiversity. When you add in arachnids, especially mites that are very diverse here, um, and other arthropods, uh, they make up more than half the biodiversity in the park. 
um, plants, uh, the wildflowers and the, the uh, native trees that bring people to the park make up 17% of the biodiversity here. And fungi, especially lichens, uh, make up a huge percent as well. So we think that there are, or there are um, uh, 900, over 900 species of lichens here in the park. And there's actually a, um, should have gotten it out. There's a great field guide specifically for the lichens of the Smokies, which I just think is so cool. Um, and of course, at the top, we have our vertebrates, uh, all the, the salamanders and, um, and birds and fish and bears and elk and all of those things that drive a lot of people to come to the Smokies uh, make up just about two and a half percent of the biodiversity here. And uh, just a little further down, broken down in terms of arthropods, uh, beetles make up 12% of the park's total biodiversity. Flies make up 10%, um, Lepidoptera 9%, et cetera. Um, we actually think uh, that there are, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, but several of these groups are still pretty understudied. Um, particularly the ant bees and wasps, um, we think that uh, the parasitic hymenoptera are actually uh, vastly understudied here and that that probably makes up a significantly larger portion of the pie. Um, true bugs are also surprisingly um, undersampled here. There's, there's some decent sampling, but, uh, but we're continuing to find a lot of new discoveries there. So I think there's more to be found in, in honestly all of these groups. So that's exciting. And we know that some of these uh, groups are better studied than others. So um, probably not surprisingly, the, the vertebrates that people are so excited about um, are very, are pretty well studied. Although we do occasionally get new, new discoveries there. Uh, a lot of the, the uh, flowering plants are, and vascular plants are pretty well studied. Um, some of the more charismatic insect groups, especially the, the uh, butterfly side of the Lepidoptera. Although again, we still get new records occasionally. But then on the other side of the, the spectrum, we have things like Hymenoptera, um, fungi. We think there's quite a few more fungi to discover. Um, beetles, flies, things like that. And of, of course, uh, bacteria and microbes are just vastly understudied. Um, and we maintain kind of a priority list of taxa um, for the park, working with the park, uh, park staff to, to kind of develop this. So these are, these are the arthropods from that priority taxa list. And I'll show you this again in a minute. <clears throat> um, but we really need help uh, with these groups. And if you go to our website, um, dlia.org, and look at the priority taxa list, there's actually more information about specifically what our needs are for each of these groups. Some of them we need um, just to be studied more. Some of them we need help identifying material um, and some other things as well. So I just wanna share with you a few discoveries uh, that we've made recently. These are just kind of a few randomly <laughs> selected discoveries because there's a lot. Uh, just this last year, two new um, uh, dragonfly species, uh, libellulids were discovered um, in a couple of different um, meadowy areas of the park, which are surprising because they're not really that, un these are not that uncommon species, especially the calico pennant, but it just hadn't been recorded yet. So these are both species, new species records. Um, this is a, a plant hopper, Nursia Florida, um, that I just happened to snap a photo of um, in uh, the Abrams Creek part of the park and put it on iNaturalist, it was identified, and lo and behold, it's a new species record. So that's pretty cool. Um, Graham Montgomery is a PhD student at UCLA that was doing his, uh, his PhD work in the park and posted uh, a lot of photos of, uh, of material that he found uh, on iNaturalist, and, um, and this is one of them. It's a, a new genus record for the park, uh, Belita, which is uh, in Diapridae as the family. 
Um, this is a, a cool parasitic uh, chalcedoid wasp that I just happened to see on a corn crib in the, uh, um, the farm museum uh, part of the park at Econolofty Visitor Center. And um, I just thought it was a cool looking wasp and snapped a few photos, put it on iNaturalist, and lo and behold, it's a new family record for the park. Um, and during a sort of peak COVID lockdown, the research coordinator for the park, uh, Paul Super, and his daughter were looking through some water samples that they'd gotten from that same area, a kind of lefty visitor center, and um, found this little critter in the center of the, the photo here. Um, it's a gastrotrica that they haven't identified yet, but, um, but it, this is a new phylum record for the park. This group are called hairy bellies, which I just think is kind of cute. Um, and it's, you know, new, how, it's just incredible that we're still finding new phyla. Um, so, and we think there are actually potentially several new phyla uh, aquatic, uh, freshwater aquatic phyla that could actually be added to our list. So that's pretty cool. Um, all of these, and this is just a, a small portion of this list. Uh, this year we've, uh, we went through um, records that people have submitted to iNaturalist. And these are uh, just a few examples of the 78 species, uh, new species, genus, family records, uh, new records that we got using iNaturalist specifically. Um, and I know some of you in the audience, um, I can point out Charlie Eisman as one of those, has helped to identify a bunch of uh, leaf miner uh, records for the park. And which has been extremely helpful. So iNaturalist uh, this last year has actually been a really great source uh, resource for um, mining new, uh, new amazing species discoveries. So this is pretty cool. So um, I just want to end by talking about um, how we need your help and how uh, you can contribute to this project if you are interested. So if you're in the park, one of the ways that you can really help us is by using just iNaturalist. So uh, I keep talking about iNaturalist and maybe not everybody knows what it is. So this is just an app that you can download to your phone um, where you can take photos of, um, of an organism. You can even record sound uh, of birds and things and post it to this platform and it'll help you identify things by photo via its uh, AI, which is semi-reliable, and uh, other people will help you to identify it as well. Uh, and we, we have this project called Smokey's Most Wanted, where we're trying to get people to just use iNaturalist to photograph or to submit uh, vouchers of anything they can find in the park. But we have kind of a, a most wanted list of species uh, that you can find on our website that um, that we're really interested in getting more observations of for various reasons. You can also um, go to iNaturalist and find our project called Smokey's ATBI on iNaturalist and help us identify things. Um, as I said, this has been a, a really great way, um, uh, a great source of, of discovery this last year. And I just think it's so cool that um, that people can just submit what they find and that can be people like anybody, any visitor can help make a, you know, discover a new species in a national park. That's just so freaking cool. So, um, yeah, iNaturalist.org, look up Smokey's ATBI and help us identify stuff. Obviously not everything could be identified from photos and uh, or from the photos, the quality of photos submitted to iNaturalist. Uh, and there is a, a bit of vetting required here, but, um, but it's still been a really incredible resource. So another thing you can do is to help us uh, fill out a survey uh, about your taxon of interest in the Smokies. So uh, to explain this, um, 
We have a project, so I, I mentioned that we think there's 60 to 80,000 species living in the Smokies, but again, that's an estimate. And we actually have a grad student, Mariah Robin, Robinson, sorry, a uh, postdoc, Mariah Robinson, who is working on this problem, uh, applying some statistical analyses to existing ATBI data um, as one source of kind of uh, um, updating our estimate for the number of species in the park. Uh, but we're also surveying taxonomists. So um, uh, asking taxonomists to basically walk through um, how many how many species uh, within their group or how how well have we inventoried their group in the park and you know what are we missing? Um, what kind of resources might we be missing? What sort of uh, actions would need to be taken to quote unquote complete the ATBI uh, in their group. And, um, and so this is a, a something that could really help us out. But yeah, so uh, the, um, yeah, the survey basically, uh, it takes 30, 30 minutes to an hour and, um, and it's a way where you can highlight additional research that needs to be done to, to sort of complete your group. And uh, that priority list that I'll show you again in a second um, on our website lists groups that we specifically need surveys for. Another thing you can do is help us to actually identify material from the Smokies. Um, so as I mentioned uh, in the early days of the Smokies um, of the, the ATBI, uh, they did a lot of sampling and we're still going through that material. So um, it's around half a million <laughs> specimens and uh, more than half of those are diptera, uh, followed by quite a lot of um, kind of homoptera, uh, hopper type hemiptera and a uh, number of, a lot of uh, particularly wasps in the hymenoptera. So we need help identifying this material. Um, and we can actually send it to you, uh, send you batches of material to identify. Um, and this is extremely helpful for us. Uh, just to sort of give you an idea of what this looks like. Um, these are, this is a package of thrips um, that I'm about to send out to a taxonomist. And uh, so most of the materials in the alcohol, although uh, some of it has been penned and um, we just need help getting some IDs on it, um, getting it as far down as you can get it. We do actually have funding available for this. Um, we give out uh, these things that we call mini grants that are usually within the range of a thousand to three thousand dollars. Uh, and the size of the grant depends on um, the task size, like how many specimens we're sending you and availability of funding. Um, and uh, this is primarily for IDing material, but we uh, would consider um, mini grants as well for, um, for working, doing uh, taxonomic work uh, sampling work on some of the priority groups in the park as well. Um, and again, you can see which um, in the priority taxa list on our website, if you look for the keyword backlog, those are the specimens that we uh, need a lot of help IDing. You can also visit the collection. Uh, we can arrange a, a tour of the, the uh, natural history collection, uh, which is in the um, in the Twin Creeks area of the Smokies near our office um, and, uh, and help us identify material there. There's still quite a bit of unidentified material there. And of course you can conduct your own biodiversity research in the Smokies. Um, so we, one of, uh, one of the reasons that we exist as an organization is to kind of help facilitate researchers uh, getting into the park and, uh, and doing research here. So you can find on our website under information for scientists, information about lodging and workspace available for doing research. Uh, we can connect you uh, with information regarding research permits and kind of help with that, facilitate that process. We can provide you with uh, ATBI, existing ATBI and biodiversity data. 
There's also information about uh, maps, GIS, lots of great environmental layers that are, that are helpful for research and of course uh, connect you with, with um, uh, apt uh, uh, park contacts as well. And there's even some uh, list of uh, re uh, research topics that the uh, park keeps up, uh, just questions they have. And here's that uh, priority, priority arthropod taxa list one more time if you want to screenshot it or anything. But again, you can find it on our website. Um, give it up just another second. And um, if I could just give a couple of quick plugs. Um, so we have our internship program. The uh, application just closed for this year, but it'll be open again next year in uh, January. And this is a really neat, immersive um, uh, internship experience for mostly undergrads, although we do take uh, master's students occasionally. And you basically run around with us, roam the Smokies, and help us with research, with events, uh, lots of lots of fun stuff. Um, we have um, an upcoming event called the Great Smokies Eco Adventure in April, uh, where you glamp, uh, glamorous camping in this really neat uh, eco camp, off the grid eco camp. Um, and we take you on some wildflower and nature walks. And of course, there'll be lots of insects out at that time. And then we also have this uh, firefly themed event. Um, in June uh, around the synchronous fireflies. And so you get a, uh, it's a really nice venue. Uh, we wine and dine you and then take you down to see the, the beautiful synchronous fireflies. There's also blue ghosts and lots of other cool glowy things. So with that, I just want to say thanks. Uh, thanks again for having me and leave it at, there's a lot of new discoveries to be made. Um, here and uh, and all over, and it's just uh, such a such a pleasure to be part of this and to be able to to be part of making all these amazing discoveries. So thank you. I'm happy to take any questions, and please feel free to email me if you have any questions or are interested in doing work in the Smokies. Thanks very much, Will. Um, just want to remind everybody if you'd like to ask. Uh, a question or, or you know, something to share, please um, go down to the, the reactions uh, button at the bottom of the screen and click on that. And then there's a, a raise hand feature. So that way um, it'll be obvious um, if you have a question. So um, see Ed, Ed Barrows has one. Hi, Ed here. I'm just wondering, once a bacteriologist said to me that each insect species might have unique bacterium species. And if that is true, that would really change your pie chart. What do you think about that? Is that true? Possibly true? It's, that sounds extremely likely. I don't know a whole lot about bacteria, but I know there is some crazy specialization. Um, and same thing for uh, parasitoids. So if you imagine that, you know, almost every insect has at least one parasit, parasitic wasp or fly or other, or five. <laughs> um, the, and, and in addition to that, each one of those has maybe a, a hyper parasitoid or something like that, that there's just gotta be crazy, crazy diversity of, of parasites and parasitoids. So I don't doubt that bacteria, that you know bacteria should take up a giant chunk of that pie. But the other question is like, that we struggle with is what's this, what do we count as a species and you know lots of other sort of uh, hard to hard to answer questions but it's something that we're 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 working on thanks for that question thanks, thanks. Juan, you want to go ahead Oh, I, I have a question. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Go ahead, Stu. 
Uh, is there a, a website that, that has a searchable thing so we can see if if species we expect to be there are recorded yet? Um, we don't have the full list on our website, but I'm happy to send you like the, the uh, I can send you the species list for um, your group of interest. Um, if you'd like, you can just email me will at dlia.org um, and, uh, and let me know what group you're interested in. We're, that's another thing we're working on having just like a full searchable list. You can't actually, I should take that back, uh, NP species like national park species um you can actually search great smoky mountains national park there and there is a, a decent list there mm -hmm. however it's not the complete list for various reasons <laughs> there's um there's a lot more a lot of species that haven't quite made it into that system yet but mm -hmm. i can send you the full list Good and our vouchers of everything collected are those maintained in the park or are they to the institutions they collected them uh, both. There are, uh, there's quite a big collection in the park, but there's also a lot of like permanent loans uh, from, from uh, contributing institutions and, and things like that. Okay. So it depends on the group. Juan, I think you had a question. Uh, yes. Uh, what do you know about other ITBI in, in North America? Um, and how the diversity of all, all those other works would overlap with the one that you are doing. Um, I only know about the, the, there is a reserve, I, I'm doing my PhD in Ohio, and there is a reserve here in, in the uh, Crane Hollow, that's the, the, I forgot the name of the region, uh, but it's, it's, it's kind of like one hour east of Cincinnati. And they have been working almost for a couple of decades over there. And it's only this couple of people, uh, Gary Kubert and, and Holly Kubert. And every time I have been there, they update um, their list. And I feel like the, the last time their list uh, was like close to 11,000 and something species. Uh, and it's, it's mostly their work. And the, the sad part about this is that, that uh, all of it is, is, I think it's in paper. Uh, nothing is on computers, like they still, still do this in the old fashion and they have the, the collection where they live. But I know that they have been like in contact with, with other people. Um, and I feel like their, their collection was even was, was appraised by, by, the, by uh, somebody at the Smithsonian, maybe Floyd. So I don't know if you know about these other uh, efforts, and I think like they have mentioned another one. So if there is any of this data that could be comparable, like you have these estimates of this total, uh, uh, like you have a third of, of the total estimated uh, uh, diversity, but what is known in this, this close area compared with yours? Yeah, that's, thanks for, thanks for all that. Yeah. Um, so as far as other ATBIs, um, I don't know of a whole lot of others, but that, that I think that's more my ignorance than they're not existing. <laughs> um, I know there is one, uh, I think there's one for the state of Maryland. Um, and one of the other national parks, uh, I want to say Acadia, um, uh, so our, our title, Discover Life in America, um, we were, back in 1998, the aspiration was that we would kind of start these, the Smokies would be sort of the flagship ATBI, and that there would be other ATBIs all around the, at the nation, dis, different national parks uh, around the country and other reserves, and that didn't really happen. Um, or I think it began, uh, or there were some in the beginning, and they kind of fizzled out. And the Smokies was the was kind of the main one that that um, stuck around as far as those go. Um, but we would love to work with some other. Um, we've talked about starting ATBIs at other reserves and and um, units, things like that. The Crane Hollow one I hadn't heard of, but I'm going to look that up uh, as soon as we are done here, because that sounds really cool. Um, and yeah, I love the, uh, we've, we're trying to 
in our uh, recent strategic plan, we talked about, you know, doing some more kind of synthesis work and, um, and looking at some, um, some regional and um, uh, other, other reserves, other units um, to see, kind of do some comparisons. And I think it's a really good idea, one, to, uh, to kind of compare between ATBIs and, and um, a good way of kind of assessing total richness and, and gaining a better understanding there. So thank you. Ah, George Washington Memorial Parkway. I will look that up too. Thank you. Anybody else uh, know of any other ATBIs? I would love to know more about that. We had a um, odd, disarticulated one in Joshua Tree that was focused a lot on obtaining barcodes. Like it was like a barcode inventory, but um, the the park proved to be just too big and too isolated um, without us there on site. We tried to do it kind of remotely. Um, and we used a lot of um, iNaturalist. We actually made a locust there. And uh, our illustrator did, a uh, Tyna did an incredible interpretive biology of the yucca moth, which everyone knows about. But mm -hmm. we talked all about the parasitoids of the yucca moth, because that's actually what's really interesting <laughs> so so we were pretty happy about that getting that in the interpretive center so um but um you know we're still still working on that one very cool i'm gonna yeah i'm this is great so uh, bill bill murphy uh, from indiana you were asking earlier will like where our members are at so bill's calling in he's, he's zooming in from indiana with a question yeah, the great white north we've had a blizzard going and it's going to continue till tomorrow night i just wanted to say that this is um, a great opportunity for um, me to let you know that there are some snail killing flies in great smoky mountain national park that were collected by gary sneck and uh mm -hmm. i think gary's with us here mm -hmm. bd sutton um, I went to Gainesville a number of years ago and brought back a treasure trove of unidentified snail killing flies. And among them were seven specimens. They were females of a species for which the female was unknown. Um, while I was there, I saw Chris Thompson for the last time. Coincidentally, he collected the second specimen of this species that's known. And of course, Chris is gone now. But anyway, an allotype I'm designating is Tennessee, Blount County, Great Smoky Mountains National mm -hmm. Park, Cades Cove Wildcat Branch. And these specimens that, that uh, Gary and Mr. Sutton collected make up about 80% of all the specimens known of this species. It's called Dictia premiosa. So I, I wonder how many more rare or unknown species lurk in those hills and hollers down there. Definitely, definitely. Or unknown species that are, have been sitting on a shelf in our office in that backlog material that I was talking about. We expect there's probably, you know, hundreds at least of, of uh, new records and probably hundreds more of um, undescribed species just sitting there waiting to be waiting to be loved yep it's a huge area it really is and just so many micro habitats it's just incredible well um could you speak to um um, you know, where the diversity is like within the park? Like, do you have a feel for which areas are, are most diverse? Um, Bill mentioned Bruce Sutton. Um, and, you know, he and I were there this past summer since we uh, couldn't travel because of COVID. <laughs> but, um, you know, one of Bruce's um, things he'll tell everyone is, you know, the 
diversity, like at least in Cades Cove, is pretty high because of the disturbance. And if, if the, the Park Service just kind of lets it all go back to forest, the diversity will actually go down, which I, I find pretty interesting. I don't know if you have any you know, comments on, on that. Yeah, I was going to say that some of the larger kind of open areas like that are probably that are disturbed or that it that are kept um, in kind of early succession habitats are probably some of the most biodiverse. Um, yeah, so uh, probably ninety five percent of the park's area that's just a ballpark number, but uh, it is forested. And then there are a few large patches of, of kind of open meadow and Cades Cove is the largest of them. Um, there's also Cataloochee Valley, the area around Oconalefti Visitor Center and a few kind of smaller places. But, um, but Cades Cove just provides this just kind of unique habitat in the park. Um, it was historically um, cleared for agriculture uh, or big swaths of it were cleared. And so it's been, uh, the National Park Service has kept it kind of in a, a similar state to that. Um, they do, they mow it and, um, and burn it occasionally. And so that's uh, provide, that kind of keeps it in this early succession. And so there are a lot of wildflowers and, and a lot of, um, a lot of plants and, and insects and things there that you just can't really find anywhere else. Um, there's also, oh yeah, um, we, so regarding early succession stuff, we also, um, we're kind of also really interested in uh, some of the uh, roadside um, mode areas. Um, I'm trying to say that the little parking areas uh, along roadways and things like that, uh, these areas that are also kept kind of in early succession um, and their, their effect on biodiversity in a similar way or power lines. There's a few kind of transmission power lines that go through that, um, that could very likely uh, provide kind of a similar, um, similar benefits in terms of uh, higher biodiversity. So uh, we are going to work on a project this summer to look at um, one of the power line right of ways. And we're also interested in some of these other other areas like that. Yeah, digression, but anyway. Um, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, have you, is a lot of these areas that are, are kept open now, are some of these historically probably were open pre-Columbus? because the Native American populations were so much higher, you know, before the European diseases were introduced. So it's possible that some of that biodiversity was there and then kind of grew back. Uh, I mean, it was, was, went underground or something as, as a tree cover came mm -hmm. back, but this is sort of before Europeans were here to see it. But is there any research on that in the area? No, oh, there's some really fascinating stuff about um, large, uh, large mammals that were historically in the area. Things like uh, like buffalo, the eastern right. eastern buffalo, something that uh, buffalo species or subspecies that was actually native here. Um, there's also, I believe very historically uh, large sloths and, and other. That's you know, what I was thinking, the really big sloths. I mean, yeah. that, that, that's a really long time frame, but, but some of those mammals didn't go extinct until humans were already here. I mean, humans yeah. killed them, so. In the blink of an eye in the geological record, yeah. Right. There's one of the, I, I'm not sure about all the kind of, kind of low elevation agricultural um, uh, things like that are, are open areas um, and their history. But the balds, there are these uh, high elevation balds, these, these high elevation grasslands that uh, are now maintained by the park, but uh, previously were maintained by um, uh, grazing on these um, 
high elevation by um, by uh, by European settlers. But before that, they were thought to have been at least some of them to have been naturally opened. And one of the ways is is through grazing by these these large ungulates and other large mammals that were historically present here. So that's really cool. So there's definitely some history with with uh, with that these kind of open area species. Super cool. So well, this is great talk and it's gotten us all really excited to um, go over there. In fact, Warren Steiner puts in the chat an NSOC field trip, which um, <laughs> it might be something that might be new business that might is going to come up where we are thinking, the executive committee is thinking about uh, doing a society kind of trip. And, you know, maybe, maybe we'll be, maybe we'll be heading that way if uh, you guys can uh, host us. <laughs> yeah, awesome. We'd be happy to. Okay, let go. Okay. <laughs> Bill Murphy has a question, I think. Yeah. Well, to follow up on the, that possibility, what's the lodging situation like around there for people that are coming to the collection and want to work with you? So, um, yeah, there's more information on that information for scientists page. Uh, there is a, a University of Tennessee field station right um, in the Greenbrier area of the park, uh, not too far away. As far as the right near the collection, there's not a great lodging situation. I can recommend like some cheap hotels, basically. Um, but there is also um, there's a, a really nice kind of uh, uh, lodging facility field station um, in the southeastern corner of the park, Purchase Knob, um, which is where uh, Bruce Sutton and uh, and Alan stay when they are. Uh, in the park, and I think they can attest to it being really nice. However, it's a long ways away <laughs> from the, the actual collections, but it's a good kind of base camp for uh, working in some of the higher elevation sites, especially on the North Carolina side of the park. So we've got, there's there's several different options. Um, and again, there's more information about that on the that page, but um, yeah, it's kind of depends on which where you're looking to go. I could just attest the, the purchase is a really gorgeous place to stay. Um, it's it's not huge. I, I, I don't know. You can probably get 20 people in there or something at the most, maybe not even that many. But like during COVID, they were limiting it to one group at a time. So like if, you know, two people had got their names on the list then nobody else could could stay there and just remember it's a really big park and there's only you know one road that goes across the middle and then the rest you know are all on the outside except for you know there's some uh, basically jeep trails you can go in a few other places so um, to, to be efficient you need to if you're going to work on the North Carolina side, you should probably stay over there. And then if you're, or if you're going to work on the Tennessee side, stay over on, on that side. Yeah, it's definitely a big place and uh, takes some logistics to, uh, to, to get around and to get to different places around here. Um, yeah, but we can help with that as well. All right. Well, thank you very much, Will. I really appreciate you, uh, you speaking to us. We've all uh, enjoyed it. Thanks. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me again. And thanks for all your great questions and all the great information that I've gotten from the answers to, to the questions. So thanks. I've got some Googling to do. <laughs> great. No, this is great. We definitely changes our plans uh, for or what are we going to be doing field work soon? So that's awesome. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, ho hopefully with COVID, uh, you know, it makes it easier to, to go there. Um, but I'm sure there'll be information on the website 
uh, regarding that. So yep. we'll, we'll look into that, but for sure, um, getting the weevils and the little weevils from the leaf litter would be exciting. So <laughs> thank you for, for joining us and thank you, Al. Well, um, does, can I ask one more question? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Will, does, does Discover Life, you know, work with any other parks or is it pretty much just centered on the Smokies? So right now we're just centered on the Smokies. Um, we'd like to, to sort of re-branch out to some other parks, but right now we're just focused on the Smokies. We also have a very small staff, so it's kind of all we can, <laughs> all we can do, but we're okay. slowly growing and uh, hopefully we'll expand. Cool, thanks. Thank you. Great, thank you. So uh, just a final announcement. Um, that our, our next speaker uh, will be Art Evans and our next meeting is the first Thursday of the month at 7 p.m., so March 3rd. And um, let's see, so do you have, I think I need a motion to adjourn. All right, yes. Okay, I see one and then a second. Yes, I see it. Okay, well, it was great seeing everyone and please stay safe. For those of you who are in the blizzard, stay warm. And thanks again, Will, and, um, and everyone for, for joining us. Yes. Yeah. Bye. Sure. Thank you. Take care, Good meeting. <clears throat> yeah. Great to see all your faces. <laughs> Thank you.